Hey everyone, today I've got my Kurzweil K2500RS uh, sampler slash synthesizer. So, uh, last year I did a whole series on these units, uh, specifically on the K2000 uh, series. So obviously the R is for rack, there's the keyboard version of these as well, but I have mostly the rack units. And I think in, it was you know, four or five parts of those videos, I kind of went through the 25 or the 2000s and some of the 2500 series and discussed a whole bunch of things with them. So uh, I looked at the SCSI to SD options, I discussed LCD replacement, uh, common repairs, common problems, features, etc. So uh, the one thing I didn't do is I didn't do a video on the 2500, uh, which is this unit here. And while architecturally the, the 2000 to the 2500 is very similar, there are some differences. So I wanted to do a quick video on the 2500 and discuss everything uh, specific to this unit that wasn't covered in those other videos. So the 2500 uh, was released in 1996 and it was the successor to the 2000 series and then this was actually later replaced by the 2600 series. Uh, so it's the middle of the modules that they had and it's probably um, in terms of price, one of the best. So it, again, the 2000 and 2500s are very, very similar, and I'll discuss that as I go through the video here. But uh, the 2500s, at least for a while, you could get you know well under $400. They don't pop up that often, so I'm not sure what they're going for now. I would imagine, pro imagine probably more, just because everything is getting more expensive the older it gets, but uh, they are very, very good units. So the first thing I wanted to talk about with this unit, uh, the 2500, is the LCD. So the LCDs on the 2500s were much improved over the 2000 series. Uh, by that I mean they're bright, and they don't fade at least as often or as much as the older 2000 series did. Uh, one of the videos I did, I, I discussed the LCD specifically. I uh, replaced the backlight in one, just the EL panel. You, know, you can get those for about $8 or so, or less sometimes. Uh, or you can go the route of replacing the actual whole LCD itself. Those cost about $30, so they're not very expensive. Uh, but in the 2500s, as I mentioned, uh, they seem to just last forever. This unit had a lot, a lot of hours on it uh, as I went through it and did a lot of uh, component replacing on here. So, And the display is still very bright, uh, even more bright than my 2000 series after replacing the EEL backlight. So that is one good thing about these. Uh, if you do want to replace them, you still can. They are a slightly different size, um, a little bit, than the 2000 series LCDs in terms of the way that it mounts. But uh, you can still buy that same $30 LCD and replace it in here if you need to. So next point I want to talk about is hard drives. So in the 2500, you've got the base here where you can actually add an internal hard drive if you wanted to, much like the 2000 series. The difference in the 2500 is they actually beefed up the power supply. You got a much larger transformer in here now that can supply, uh, supply a lot more current than the 2000 series. And like I talked in the 2000 video about this, uh, with hard drives in the 2000, a lot of times the current needed for that drive would prevent this unit from even powering on. So they solved that with a bigger power supply in the 2500. Now, that said, you still shouldn't really put a SCSI drive in here unless you just happen to have one and it's free and you want to use it. Uh, do SCSI to SD. It's just better for all the different reasons. I did a video on that too, uh, covering these things. It's identical in this unit in terms of replacing it because the connector and everything where it lives is exactly the same. So that would be the route that I would go uh, if you wanted to add an internal hard drive. There's extra, or you can do external options too if you want to go that route, but uh, internally use SCSI to SD. So in the very bottom, uh, your lowest board in the unit, which is the power slash audio board, as I call it, um, your power supply sits down here, and, the, and then this section at the very bottom, you've got your DACs, and then um, your DSP in terms of the, uh, the, the stock um, effects unit on there, along with just some other, uh, the main microprocessor for the unit and some other logic and stuff that down there. Now, these two boards are basically identical between the 2000 and the 2500. So I've got another 2000 board sitting around here somewhere. I can throw a picture of them up. But they're very similar, and I would be almost willing to bet that you could probably swap them out between the two, between 2000 and the 2500. Uh, the only difference I've noticed really between them is the, the firmware version, revisions on the actual EEPROMs down buried underneath the, uh, the uh, other boards here. So uh, I've never tried it, but if you happen to have one and wanted to do it just as a part scene or something like that, I'd be curious to know if it actually worked. Um, my guess is, like I said, if you swap those EEPROMs out, it probably would. Now, on the main power supply board, uh, this unit, again, come out in 1996, it's approaching 30 years old. Uh, I would recommend replacing capacitors in the power supply, which lives right here, along with capacitors in the audio circuitry. Uh, there's not very many in here. Total, there's probably 25-ish, I think there was. I've already done them um, uh, previously, just off camera, as I repaired this unit myself. Uh, but I talked about that again in one of the other videos. But the main thing to note is that down in the audio section, uh, there's two 5-volt regulators 
that live uh, right near where the DACs are. And those are actually used by the analog devices, uh, digital analog converters, for their plus and five or plus and minus five volt rails. And they stuck a cap right between those two five volt regulators. And that thing always gets cooked pretty bad. So I replaced everything in that section anyway, like I said, just do them all. Uh, if you really want to give this you know unit additional lifespan to you know make it last another 30 years. So definitely a good thing to do uh, is replace capacitors on this just to uh, maintain its life. Now another note that I want to make on these devices is, again, it's back together so I can't show it, but I took pictures of it. There's little black standoffs they used in various places on this unit. One sits over here behind the, the actual sampler board, and then one sits down below in the back that actually separates um, the engine board from the main power supply board. And the black rubber they used over time uh, just completely breaks down and deteriorates and just turns into like this nasty black goop and it just kind of goes everywhere. Uh, I had that unit, I had that problem on this unit and I had to, it was a mess. I had to clean it up. It got all over the chassis, all over the boards, uh, take a little bit, but just some isopropyl alcohol, get in there and just with a small brush, you can usually clean it up pretty well. Uh, I wasn't at the point where I was getting a lot of corrosion on mine, but it was just starting. And that's why it's really important to get that stuff out of there while you can. Uh, very important um, to maintain the, the life of these units. So the engine board, which is this board that sits right here. This is actually the daughter board, the engine board. The engine board sits below. It's got the RAM on here, uh, on there. Um, that board is very, very similar to the engine board that's on the, uh, the 2000. And the main difference of it in it is that with the 2500, you double your polyphony. So you got 48 voices instead of 24. And that shows on this board. Uh, if you look on there, if you remember both the Kelvin and Janus versions of it, you know, you had your multiple uh, TSP chips on there do various things. There's like double of those on this board. So your effects board. So stock effects on the 2500, just like the 2000, because it lives down in this very bottom board there, is your Digitech. I think it's a 250. In the 2000, and along with the 2500, uh, Kurzweil just licensed the Digitech 250 effects processor, that, that circuitry basically, and just stuck it in the middle of this unit. And that's your stock effects. So when you go into your effects processing on the 2500, your menus, that's what it's actually using. Now, there's the KDFX unit, uh, which is a board that plugs into this daughter board here, which is a really, really powerful set of DSP effects for the 2500. Uh, it's very rare to find them, so mine unfortunately doesn't have it, and uh, a lot of the ones that I watch usually don't have it in terms of that board actually showing up in a unit. It was a really expensive option as well. One neat shortcut that I want to show is that if you're looking for a unit and you don't know if it has KDFX on it or not, say if you're buying a parts unit or you're just looking at one off the shelf, you know, maybe used somewhere, uh, if it has KDFX inside, this connector will be populated. If this connector isn't populated, then it uh, definitely does not have the KDFX board inside. So kind of just a neat shortcut to know if it has KDFX or not without being able to power it on. So sample RAM. Your sample RAM lives here. In my unit it uses 30 pin SIMs. Uh, it's buried right inside. Get a better picture of that. But uh, this unit's got eight 30 pin uh, SIM sockets on there and this will support up to 128 megs of RAM. So the earlier revisions of the 2500's engine board used 30 pin SIM sockets. Later revisions, after revision K, we actually used 72-pin SIMs, and those had two 72-pin SIM sockets on here instead. So you can check the serial number to detect the revision. I don't remember the exact uh, change over what it was, but Kurzweil's got that documented on their site if you're curious. But uh, it's just nice because these also just use 30 or 72-pin SIMs, which are still relatively easy and cheap to get uh, for upgrading the actual sample RAM in use. Both units do max out at 128 megs, so which even by today's standards, that's still quite a bit of sample memory uh, for for sampling. The next difference with the 2500 is your program RAM. So, program RAM is where all your user settings and configurations and uh, all your all your programs live. Basically, any any user configurable or setup option on the synth lives in your program RAM or your PRAM as they call it. So, stock it comes with 256k, but you can upgrade that to a meg. And there's a socket right in the back. Right back there, we'll get a picture of it that actually plugs into. Now, original Kurzweil program RAM is almost impossible to find, and there's some third parties that make it, but it's still expensive, like 80, 90, 100 bucks or something like that. But when I was doing my vi uh, videos on the 2000 series, a viewer had actually contacted me, uh, stating, hey, there's this uh, open source one out there that somebody had designed and basically has a board available on with the design files in GitHub and then um, the component listing as well. So for around, it was like, 12 or 15 dollars you could actually just build one uh, get the boards made i used those park to actually make the boards and get them sent to me and then assemble it and throw it in here now i i bought that and i have it but the life of me i can't find it anywhere so it's around here somewhere i bought it last year i'm still going to upgrade it i just need to find it uh, but it is a very cost effective way of doing this 
um, and even have DigiKey part numbers and stuff like that for the SRAM that actually plugs into that module, which is pretty cool. Sound RAM expansions, so the 2500 uses the same Sound RAM expansions as the 2000 series. Those two boards are tucked right uh, back over here. Again, I'll get a picture so it's a little bit easier to see. So you've got the orchestral and contemporary uh, sound modules along with, I think, one or two others as well that you can plug in here to expand this out for additional factory sounds. So sampler option. Uh, sampler board plugs right over here in the side. So sampler jacks in the front, and then the actual board is right here. Get that in frame right there, that board. So it's the same board used in the 2000 and the 2500 series. Uh, you can swap them between the two. And it, the sampler board can be added to any uh, Kurzweil sampler, 2000 and 2500 too. On units that don't have it, this, this front panel is the same. These are just blanked out. And then they don't have the S on the actual front uh, nameplate there. So that's the only differences. But you can always just add that board in. There's a couple digital audio cables that connect back uh, there. And then this digital cable as well that connects to the, one of the, the uh, main engine board. But Again, the sampler boards themselves are super rare to find, so if you do want the sampler version of this, it's better just to try to find one uh, and buy it that way. So firmware updates on the 2500. Uh, firmware on this unit is flash-based instead of EEPROM-based, which is nice. So as it boots up, usually it'll flash the version number right on the screen. Uh, right there, I've got version 3.02, which is actually still an older version. Uh, 3.5 is the version that you want to use for this unit. Uh, it's the latest version. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Latest version for it uh, has a bunch of features, better SCSI performance, a few other things as well, which is really, really nice. So the neat thing is that Kurzweil still supports these units uh, in terms of their website. So if you go to Kurzweil.com, go to somewhere in support, find the 2500, they will have basically everything for this unit there, which is awesome. They've got all the original man manuals, um, any like errata with those manuals as well. They've got all the firmware versions you can download for this. They've got all the FRAM files, which are basically like user presets for these units in terms of the different sounds from the actual um, uh, sound modules. They've got, just again, massive amounts of documentation, tutorials, Q&A sections, like everything. So it's really awesome that Kurzweil still has that much information out there for these units. Uh, you usually don't find that from really any manufacturer, especially for stuff that's you know, approaching 30 years or like the 2000 series, you know, over 30 years old at this point. So uh, kudos for Kurzweil for that. Uh, it really helps in terms of maintaining these units and definitely keeping them working. So back to the firmware. So 2.5 is the version you want, but there's actually various different versions of firmware for the unit, depending on the configurations you have inside. So 2.5 is kind of the base firmware for it, but as you change different ROM modules in there, there's different versions that will go up. I think 2.6, 2.7, I think that's how they number them for that. Um, because it changes, if you remember in the 2000 series, you had the setup ROMs. The setup ROMs kind of mapped the sounds to the actual samples that were in those, those sound modules. So we had to have different uh, setup ROMs depending on the configuration for the actual um, modules that you had in there for your, your sounds. It's the same way with this, except for they're just all flash based, so you have to grab the right one. Same thing if you have the KDFX unit. If you have a KDFX unit installed, the versions I think are up in the fives, like five dots, one, I can't remember exactly. It's, it's, it's all documented on the website, but you've got to get the right firmware version for it with the KDFX module as well. So that's another important fact. So a couple last little details. Um, these units are fan drawn. That is, they actually draw air from the top and bottom through holes on the case and then push it out the back to keep them cool. So that's kind of why I'm not keeping this on very long with the uh, with the unit on, just because you're not getting that air circulation to keep everything cool. But the important part about that is that as you rack these units, you need to make sure there's proper airflow getting into the unit and then drawing it out the back. If you had this tight in a rack with gear just smashed on top of it, you know, above and below, airflow is going to be really restricted or even completely blocked in some cases. And when that happens, you know, air's got to get in here somewhere. And usually the next thing will happen is the air will start getting drawn through all those gaps around the buttons and the dial and stuff like that. And that becomes very problematic. So uh, this unit was that way. I've got a picture here of the front panel as I took it off on all the dust that was just caked into here uh, throughout, which was kind of a mess. Now that unit had all sorts of problems with the buttons too. Actually, I've still got it sitting here. So all my buttons were worn uh, out of the 2500. But if you notice here on this board, it says for the 2000R slash 2500R. They use the exact same board. So I just took another board from one of my parts 2000R units, swapped it in here, and that gave me new silkscreen buttons with nice clean uh, labels on them as well. But, so again, the two series, this between the 2000 and 2500, are basically interchangeable in terms of a lot of the hardware inside. Finally, I did add a GoTech uh, uh, USB floppy drive emulator for this just because uh, 
the floppy drive in here was dead. It had drawn so much dust through it, and I had tested it, and it just wasn't working anyway. But uh, these are great. I mean, you see them everywhere. They're like 20 bucks. Um, definitely like them. I'm not putting a SCSI to SD drive in this one like I did in my other 2000 because I've got an actual external SCSI drive that I'm going to be using with it uh, that I'll be hooking up to the back. So, and I use that with various uh, Kurzweil's that I have, among other samplers. It makes an easy way to actually move uh, sounds between them by using the external, uh, external SCSI drives on there. So that's really it. Again, just a quick video on the 2500 uh, series as I went through it and did all the repairs and cleanups on it like I did in my other 2000 units. Uh, this is really good working shape right now. I've still got a few things I want to do. Upgrade that firmware, like I said. Uh, to upgrade it, it's simple. You just download the appropriate file off Kurzweil's site and then basically put it on a floppy or in my case uh, on the USB floppy and get it on there. And then you go through a couple steps to upgrade it. But the documentation for that is really clear on how to do it. So I'll do that. I'm going to upgrade the program RAM. And that's really it. Just uh, get it back in my rack and start using it. So these Kurzweil's, these samplers and synthesis engines, I mean, especially the, you know, Kurzweil's got vast, as they call it, like, it's so unbelievably powerful and complex. They're just really, really awesome units. Uh, I definitely highly recommend them. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a big learning curve to it. I've really only scratched the surface of the vast with the ones I have and I've played with, but uh, they are super, super fun to play with. So definitely recommend. So anyway, again, quick video. Hope this was beneficial. Thank you for watching.